Resident Evil Afterlife in 3D. Alice takes her clone army and charges at Wesker to get revenge. Now if you haven't watched the first three movies, or at least Extinction, the third one, you probably have no idea as to the meaning of what I just said. Unfortunately, this movie is not going to explain it anymore to you. But I would. Basically, Alice is our good-hearted protagonist from the first three films, and Wesker is the leader of the evil multinational corporation behind the virus and the whole state of affairs. Oh, uh, actually, that's, that's it. That's the entire plot of the movies and the character development of those two characters. Anyway, after that, Alice, now rid of her powers, which she just barely used, flies around by herself without the aid of a clone army, trying to get to Arcadia, the location that seemed to promise hope in Extinction, the third movie. She, once again, winds up trapped in a location with other survivors and seeks to save them all. This is the fourth movie, right? Not the first, the second, or the third. Yeah, they all have this one basic plot. But hey, that's not what we watch these movies for, now is it? Let me beat around the bush no longer. This movie is very entertaining. It's unbelievably stupid, but it's very entertaining. And most of the time, for the right reasons. Oh, the dialogue is poor, what there is of a plot is incredibly thin, there's zero character development, there's a couple of characters that could be written out, there's unexplained fan service. In general, there are almost no explanations for anything in this movie. There are plot holes aplenty. However, it's fun. With a few exceptions, I don't like Paul W. S. Anderson's films. And there certainly aren't any of them that I would go so far as to actually call good. Event Horizon, for example, is decent and an enjoyable film, but I wouldn't call it good. And I would say that the best he's done is either Event Horizon or this, which is also not a good film. I keep watching his new movies in a kind of morbid curiosity because I do not understand why I guess a lot of people like his movies, and if not, why on earth he keeps getting to make them. He's really not a terribly good writer or director, but he's getting better, judging from this at least. Oh, there are the same cliches of his, the things where he thinks he's so clever because he does what the other movies don't, when really he's just breaking rules that he apparently doesn't understand. I always say, you learn the rules, you understand the rules, then you can start to decide if you want to break them. I'm not a fan of the original Saw, but Something they did in that was not have the traditional establishing wide shot. Every time they cut to a location, they cut to inside of it, not outside of it. And this creates a certain sense of claustrophobia. That is an example of someone breaking a rule, going against convention, for a reason and with good effect. What Anderson will do is establish for example, a group of characters, or a plot device, only to reveal minutes later that nothing would come of this group of characters or this plot device. And that's just bad storytelling. I mean, you don't have to have every character in your movie make a difference, but then don't establish them as if they are. He also has a tendency to killing off people without actually developing them, and he likes to do this in a very swift manner. And yes, some death scenes go on for way too long in Hollywood, but there is a reason that death gets stretched out in a lot of fiction, film fiction at least. It's to milk the moment. Any piece of good filmed entertainment is going to milk at least some of its moments. Why have the moments if you're not at all going to milk them? He also seems to like false tension where there will be plenty of build-up to something that turns out to be absolutely nothing, and then maybe, like, just as soon as we've calmed down, he'll throw something at us. Now again, this just isn't a good way to do it. 
You build up and then you have a climax. It's a convention for a reason. It's a convention in all storytelling. Your average joke consists of setup and payoff, build up and climax. Anyway, yes, he still uses some of these cliches. But there are less in this than in his other films. And granted, he now does incorporate more Hollywood cliches than he tends to. But still, on the whole, it wasn't terribly disappointing. I have to admit, the trailer got me really hyped for this movie. And I had a really hard time believing that the film was going to live up to that. It really got my adrenaline pumping. So I walked in kind of expecting that it wouldn't live up to it. I mean, this was as excited as I've ever been for a Resident Evil film. And while the very beginning is absolutely useless, it picks up almost immediately after that. And it kept my attention for the full 90 minutes. And no, that doesn't sound like a lot, but the others lost me here or there along the way because of the bad script and or direction. This one actually does have some setup and payoff. Instead of just jumping to the big explosion, Anderson has also gotten much better at spacing out the action and of the action not being excessive. Honestly, this is the first movie I've seen by him, and I've seen most of them, where almost all of the action genuinely works. He's finally realized that it is just not within the capabilities of the human body to maintain a constant heightened sense of anxiety. Sooner or later, you have to turn it down a little bit. Let us exhale, let us breathe. And yes, there are movies that quite effectively pull off being intense from start to finish, but they do it in a different way. In most of what you see by Anderson, he tries to keep you on the edge of your seat all the way, and sooner or later you get overstimulated, or you simply realize that I don't care about any of these characters. This one is genuinely exciting. The action is very cool. Anderson does still have... Anderson does still throw in some ideas that he probably thinks are a lot more clever than they actually are. Honestly, some of the things he thinks up... I really don't know how he himself could believe that they're gonna be quite that good. Think of one of, think of one of the first scenes of Soldier, if you've watched it. The test for these new super soldiers as compared to the old super soldiers is climbing a rope and then staying at the top of that rope for a long time. They're not going to grapple, they're not going to try to fight each other from the rope, they're just going to climb a rope and hang in there. Yeah. The music is also a lot more fitting and it feels less noisy. He tends to really crank up the volume on this hard, heavy metal. And I don't have a problem with heavy metal. It's just that the heavy metal he chooses almost never fits with the pace of the scene. It's like you're trying to watch an action movie, and in the other room, someone is listening to completely unrelated, loud heavy metal. And, it pl and he plays it so loud that you can't hear the soundtrack to the movie you're watching. That's essentially the effect it usually has. Here, it actually works pretty well most of the time. The music really got me into it. It's again, a lot of heavy metal and a lot of techno. I'd also say this has the best costumes of any of them. I would say this is due to Denise Cronenberg. Seriously, the Cronenbergs are just immensely talented. 